Good evening. Uh, it's wonderful to see everyone here on this warm Chicago evening. Thank you for being in this dark auditorium, but I guarantee that you'll be hearing a wonderful presentation tonight full of life and color. Tonight you will be hearing a program, Van Gogh and the Avant-Garde, The Power of Place, which is generously sponsored by J.P. Morgan, Chase & Co. My name is Jacqueline Coutre, and I am the Eleanor Wood Prince Associate Curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture of Europe, and also the curator of Van Gogh and the Avant-Garde, The Modern Landscape. Before we continue, uh, just a brief reminder to silence your mobile devices. I see people actually moving and checking them, so that's a good sign. It is my distinct honor to introduce today's speaker, Lauren Wright. Lauren is an assistant director in interpretation at the Art Institute of Chicago. She works with curators and other staff across the museum to tell inclusive and accessible stories about art. In her time at the museum, Lauren has worked on several exhibitions, including Salvador Dali, The Image Disappears, The Language of Beauty and African Art, and the current Van Gogh Show. She also leads tours and participates in public programs as she really enjoys engaging with visitors like you. Lauren received her master's in museum and exhibition studies from the University of Illinois Chicago, where her research explored new and better ways to tell black stories in museums. On a personal note, Lauren has been an outstanding contributor to the exhibition, helping to make all texts from the timeline to the object labels to the script for the video, clear, succinct, and foremost engaging. I know that you are in for a tremendously thoughtful and enlightening reflection on this exhibition. Now please join me in welcoming Lauren Wright. All right, good evening. Thank you, I love to hear it back. Um, I appreciate you making your way to the Art Institute at the end of the workday. I, I won't blame you if this is something of a sleepy crowd, but I will appreciate if you laugh at my jokes <laughs> um, and ask questions um, at the end of the lecture. Um, I do want to say thank you to Jacqueline for that introduction, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Oh, I need the clicker. I am sleepy at the end of my workday, but I promise the lecture will be good. All right. So, The Power of Place, that's the title of this lecture. So we're going to start kind of big picture. Art influences culture. I think we can all agree on that. But I'm interested in the reverse of that, how culture influences art. Artists are influenced by the world around them, the physical environment, the society that they are a part of, and how they relate to those various factors. If we were going to make a formula of what art is, we might say that it's an artist's unique perspective plus the circumstances that they are creating their art in. We could probably add a bunch of a million other little factors, but those are the big two. Um, and so today we're going to look at how place and time affects the art that is created in it. We're going to look at two different places and times, two very distinct places and times, in fact, um, and explore the art that was made or came out of them. So we're going to start where the exhibition starts, along the Seine River um, in the northwestern suburbs of Paris in the 1880s. And to start there, I want to give you a little background on the city of Paris. So Paris had a big modernization push led by Napoleon III. So between 1853 and 1870, he launched a campaign to modernize Paris, and he spent more than 2.5 billion francs, um, francs excuse me, for that. Um, he wanted to broaden the streets. So as we see here, we have Paris Street Rainy Day by Kayabat, and we've got these big, wide boulevards. If you've ever seen a, pro a production of Les Mis, you might remember when they barricade those narrow streets. So he was trying to avoid like easy revolution <laughs> um, going forward, um, as well as just like a nicer look, because of course um, these broad streets are really appealing if you've been to Paris lately. Um, he also wanted to add more green spaces and sites of recreation, um, add more housing, and just overall improve residents' quality of life. Um, so to do that, they brought in the streets, um, they, added, they planted trees, they added gas street lamps to all of the streets, um, and they also built um, a 
wide array of new apartment buildings. And to make all of these changes, they had to destroy about 27,000 buildings that were currently there, which displaced about 350,000 people, most of whom were working class people, um, because of course, those who had the money to live elsewhere or to live in the new apartment buildings that had just been constructed did so. At the same time, uh, this, the second half of the 19th century is when the second industrial revolution took place. So steel is big, there's lots of new technological innovations, and so railroads are being built. Um, two large train stations were constructed in 1849 and 1866 in Paris, and by 1880, there were 15,000 miles of track. Um, some of those passenger stations um, were placed in the northwest suburbs of Paris. So we're looking here at a map, a period map of Paris. You can see the Eiffel Tower right here. And if we zoom in, I know the quality is not great. I apologize. Um, we can see up here in this corner, the northwest suburbs of Paris. So we've got Clichy, Anier, Colombe and Bois Colombe, um, Corbevoix, and here in the center, Le Grand Jat, which may sound familiar to you. Um, so different passenger train stations were built along these suburbs going out from Paris all the way to Normandy. Um, so these suburbs were better connected, more easily connected to the city of Paris, although of course a lot of the space was walkable as well. Industry began to emerge um, as these changes began to take place in Paris, like the gas street lamps, for example, you need somewhere to get the gas from. Um, so gas works, factories, um, all sorts of sites of industry began to be built in these northwest suburbs to help support um, the new Paris. Here we've got a glass factory um, on the top left, and at right, a coal crane. So here, this is the coal crane, and this is a port that ships come into to deliver the coal um, to various factories and works. But these areas were also sites of leisure, so it wasn't just factories all the time. It was also a really beautiful part of Paris, it still is. Um, and so Parisians would leave Paris and go on day trips um, into these suburbs. Uh, this is the Anier Rowing Club. Anier was known as the holy city of boating. Um, there would be boat races, people would take boat rides um, and enjoy being on the water, but also on the banks of the Seine, doing sunbathing, promenading, um, all that good stuff. Leisure was a new concept um, in a way at this time because the work week had just become standardized um, or somewhat standardized. So people more regularly had Sundays off and they needed something to do with that time. Um, so often they would come out to these suburbs and enjoy their day off. It's these contradictions, this combination that was so interesting. Um, here we have a quote from an anonymous travel writer from 1856 um, in a travel guide. He called these suburbs aggressive, industrial, and bourgeois all at the same time. So there was a lot going on. There were you know, factories, people relaxing. It was kind of a rich site of contradictions. And it is that richness that drew the artists in the exhibition to this area. Five artists are featured in Van Gogh and the avant-garde, the modern landscape. And they all converged in the northwestern suburbs of Paris in the 1880s. Paul Signac was first to arrive. He arrived in 1880. He was a teenager. He moved with his family to Anniers. In 1881, Joyce Seurat began to discover the suburbs. Emile Bernard, also a teenager, um, arrived in 1884. He moved into a house between Anier and Corbevoix with his family and began painting in the area. Charles Grand arrived in 1885. He began to paint on the banks of the Seine in Anier. And Van Gogh was the last to arrive. Um, in 1887, he embarked on a three-month campaign in Anier and a nearby suburb. Um, he actually stayed for the shortest period of time of all of these men. He was only there for three months, like I said, um, and painted about 40 paintings. So he was very busy during this time, um, really inspired by what was around him. Uh, and he stayed in Paris for a little longer. He was there for about two years, right at the end of his life, as you can see. While they were there, these artists invented new techniques. They innovated. They were really inspired by what they saw. The first is divisionism. Divisionism was pioneered by Georges Seurat and Paul Signac. They were inspired by color theories of the time, um, developed by scientists Ogden Rude and Michel Eugène Zervoul, um, who found that as opposed to mixing 
unique combinations, custom combinations to, to apply directly to the canvas. Instead, to apply pure, unmixed tones that would then combine in the eye to produce a different color. It's called optical mixing. So you have separate brush strokes of different colors that when you step away, produce a new color. They then developed, they innovated further on the same theme and developed pointillism, which is just an offshoot of divisionism that uses dots, or point in French, um, instead of brush strokes. Um, so again, you can see those separate colors, unmixed colors, that then will mix in your eye. The last technique um, was used by artists like Emile Bernard um, and Paul Gauguin, who is not in this exhibition, where we have flat passages of color, like this orange here, um, delineated by thick, dark outlines. Um, those are emulating small compartments of metalwork called poison in French, um, that were used by, in metalwork in the medieval period. So that's where that name comes from. These artists applied these techniques not evenly. They were innovating them, using them unevenly, um, developing the technique, perfecting the techniques across their canvas canvases on a wide variety of themes. So let's walk through a few of them. They painted on the water, um, or they painted people on the water, although Signac was actually known to paint in his sailboat directly on the water. Um, but they frequently painted fishermen in boats, people in boat races, rowing clubs, etc. At left, we have Fishing in Spring, which is part of a triptych by Van Gogh. Van Gogh painted three triptychs, or trios of paintings, um, uh, during this time, during his campaign. Uh, and this is part of the Clichy uh, triptych, which we can tell by the red outline. Um, Van Gogh never really fully took on any of these new techniques. Um, and you might recognize, you know, when he, in his later paintings, he didn't use these techniques. But he sort of tried them out, and you can see, like on one canvas, periods where places where he did try, you know, a divisionist technique, and places when he did not. So here you can see, like for example, on this tree trunk here, the separate strokes of white and green that then produce the bark color of the tree trunk. What was most um, unique about or impactful to Van Gogh during this time was the color palette. Prior to painting uh, in these suburbs, he had a very muted earth tone sort of color palette. Um, but here you can see, right, these bright greens and blues. He said that when he got to Anier in a, sister, in a letter to his sister, that he saw more color than ever before. So we've got a much brighter color palette. That's the clear, um, the most distinct takeaway from Van Gogh's time here. At the right, we have the Sun at Dawn. I love this painting by Angran. I really recommend that you go to the exhibition and see it in person because it's got such texture that this image doesn't quite communicate. It's done in a pointillist style. So here we're seeing sort of the far away takeaway of what those colors look like mixed. But when you get up close, you can see those individual dots, um, which is really striking. I love that there's a glow, a light glow around the fisherman and his boat, um, sort of glowing in that early morning light. Um, it's just got a really serene, distant, sort of fuzzy quality. He referred to this painting as a symphony in gray, which I think is a lovely turn of phrase. These artists also painted in the town. Um, so here at right, we've got the Restaurant de la Serene by Van Gogh. Um, the Restaurant de la Serene was like a very popular spot for day trippers who would, for dining. It was right on the banks of the Seine, so you could sit out front and watch boat races or boats come in um, and really take in the scene. Van Gogh painted this street um, along with the restaurant from a few different angles, um, so you'll see a couple of those in the exhibition. He was very interested in this area. At left, we've got the Festival of Anier. This is a summer fair. Um, done by Signac. I love this painting because you can so clearly see the separate tones um, that he used to compose the ground. We've got blonde tones, but there's some blue, some pink, some reddish orange in here that produce the, the ground in the sunlight, versus on here, uh, almost lavender color in the shade that's composed of green and red and dark blue. Um, all of those colors mixing together to create the ground. These artists also painted leisure. They were very interested in the idea of promenading, of relaxing on the banks of the Seine. Um, so here we've got a couple of watercolors by Bernard. Um, here on the right, you can see those 
those dark outlines that he used um, in his more traditional like oil paintings. Um, but this topic was of particular interest or a particular favorite of Seurat. Here we have an oil sketch for uh, Sunday on the Grand Jatte, which you might be really familiar with. Um, but instead of using pointillism, the dots that he ended up using in a Sunday on the Grand Jatte, we've got brush strokes. So earlier on, when he did multiple studies and sketches for a Sunday on the Grand Jatte, which is, of course, a massive painting, so he wanted to practice it, um, over time, he decided that he wanted not to use divisionism, but instead to, to use pointillism. I actually prefer the sketch. There's a real like immediacy. You can really feel um, the artist's hand. You can imagine him painting it, um, as opposed to the finished painting, which is much more polished, um, much more final. Although I will agree that I think the composition, as he played with the placement of different people and groups, um, I think the composition is maybe a little more balanced. This is on viewing gallery 240, if you want to have a little Ferris Bueller moment. <laughs> Lastly, these artists painted sites of industry and uh, symbols of modernity. So at left, we have Bernard using more of a divisionist style than his Cloisonna style that he used in the end, um, painting the river, and of course factories with their, their signature smoke sacks and plumes of smoke going into the air. At right, we've got Signac painting a coal crane in Clichy. Um, this painting is so interesting to me because you can see the water, it's pretty good water, like that the reflection of the ship, the way of the boats, the way the light is dappling across the water. I think it's pretty representative of life, but at right, what is this? Uh, it's harder to interpret, right? It's a riverbank and a hill perhaps going up, um, but it's much flatter. The colors are muddier. It's harder to read. Um, so in one canvas, right, he really succeeds at, at, with the technique in one place and kind of struggles with it in another. So it's a really interesting example of him working on the technique, really figuring it out. Um, and remember, he was quite young, um, in his 20s, in his teens when he first moved to the suburbs and in his 20s as, as the decade went on, um, really figuring this stuff out um, and innovating on the fly. What is most interesting to me is the combination um, of these themes together, especially the contradiction between leisure and industry or between man and industry, man and machine. Um, so here we have Seurat. Uh, this is a study for bathers at Anier. Um, we've got people reclining on the riverbank and bathing in the river, and then in the distance, really pretty smokestacks and smoke. Um, it actually looks like really like a nice cloud, almost, <laughs> um, which I'm sure it was not that nice of a cloud. It was probably horrible to breathe in that air, <laughs> I would imagine, um, but it looks really lovely here. This is Factories at Clichy by Van Gogh. This is the only time that Van Gogh painted factories or other sites of industry. It seemed that he was not really interested in how they looked aesthetically um, and didn't really want to commit them to canvas. But I love this painting. Um, I love the big open expanse of the grass, um, the colorful homes and roofs there, and then in the distance just beyond all the smokestacks sort of lining the horizon. Um, I especially love that there's a couple in the grass just here going for a stroll, pushed right up against um, this massive smokestack. So they look so small in comparison. And I'm sure, I, I mean, I don't know, um, but it feels like a commentary on our relationship to these, these sites of industry, how small we are in comparison. This is a pointillist ink drawing by Signac. He developed this for print and newspapers. Um, which I think is really cool. Um, this um, particular drawing was too complicated for print, so he actually gave it a second try um, and produced another version that did end up going into a newspaper. Um, but I love, these are gas tanks in the background and then a family sort of walking through a field. Um, again, I love that contrast between man and the physical environment. Lastly, this is my favorite to discuss. Um, this is Two Women on the Onier Footbridge by Bernard. Again, you can see like the bright passages of color and then the, the thick, dark outlines. 
Um, we have two women walking together, crossing the pedestrian bridge between Anyar and Clichy. Um, a barge in top left, and then these are coal cranes once again. These women are rag pickers. Um, rag pickers were people who collected discarded material or like garbage off the streets to resell to recycling facilities. In 1883, there was um, a decree in force that enforced the use of metal garbage containers. So all of the garbage was no longer loose on the street and went directly into receptacles. And so it kind of did away with this centuries-long tradition of rag picking. So these women are sort of representatives of a bygone era. I love in particular that they are looking to the left, walking to the left. Um, as opposed to the smoke at the top right that's blowing to the right. So if you think about like a timeline, for example, to the left is the past, and as you go to the right, you're getting closer to the future. Um, so we're sort of looking back versus looking forward into modernity. Um, and I also love the way they're split on two halves of the canvas, so they're in almost completely different worlds. They're separated. Um, it's a very interesting combination of these two, these two concepts. So that's a little bit of the art that's in the exhibition, a little bit of the art that was produced in the northwestern suburbs of Paris in the 1880s. And now we're going to talk about something different, a little closer to home. So we're going to talk about some art that came out of the Chicago South Side um, just recently in the 2010s. So first, we have to know what the South Side is. So we are in the pink, in the loop, um, and the definition of the South Side varies widely. The loose definition, you can say, is pretty much anything south of the loop. So this map defines it as the yellow area, but we could say it's the yellow, the orange, the green, this color that I can't define, this teal color, perhaps, baby blue, not really sure. Um, so some people think, you know, Inglewood is the south side, Chance the Rapper is from Chatham, that's the south side, but they've got more specific names depending on how you talk about it. The South Side started developing, um, neighborhoods in general started developing south of the loop in the 1850s, but they, they really started to take hold after the Great Chicago Fire, which took place in 1871. Um, so people really wanted to get out of the city and leave the city center, and so they began to move south. Um, both wealthy and poor alike, wealthy people began to settle along the lakefront, um, but middle-class families and poor families also began to settle um, throughout the South Side. Uh, the, just like in Paris, the second Industrial Revolution is, is really going strong, um, and so railroads are becoming huge um, in the United States just as, as they were in Europe. So the Illinois Central Railroad, which connected um, Chicago to New Orleans, was chartered in 1851, so they began be building that and it opened its first passenger station in Hyde Park in 1856. So we're looking at that station right now. Um, and stops be, continued to be built throughout Chicago and along the south side as time went on. Industry also began to emerge uh, on the south side beginning in the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, we're looking at, at left at Union Stockyards, which was a massive meatpacking plant. Um, and at right, Wisconsin Steel, which was a steel, a steel mill. I've been struggling with that phrase all night. Steel mill. Um, and there were also factories, other steel mills, other meat packing plants that opened on the south side uh, towards the end of the 19th century. And these sites of industry were, of course, massive employers. So people began to move here to work at these locations, um, especially immigrants um, to Chicago. All the way from this point in time, all the way through the end of World War II, waves of immigrants would arrive and move to the south side to work at meatpacking plants, factories, um, steel mills, uh, and, the work, and the like. At the same time, or at, around this time, there was already a small population of black Americans on the South Side, but that population increased greatly after the Civil War. Uh, the Great Migration took place in two waves, from 1910 to 1940 and from 1940 to 1970. Um, so black Americans migrated north in search of greater opportunity, um, leaving the South. About six million black Americans left the South um, during the Great Migration, and a good chunk of them landed in Chicago. They moved to a narrow strip south of the loop that became known as the Black Belt. 
and they were highly restricted from moving into the neighboring white middle class and working class neighborhoods, which resisted their movements. So residential segregation emerged immediately and was a hallmark of the South Side pretty much from this point of time going forward. If you're familiar with the race riot of 1919, a lot of those um, skirmishes and incidents and injuries all took place on the South Side, um, where these racial tensions were quite high. All the same, there was a period of prosperity that came. Um, so in the 1920s, Bronzeville really flourished. Um, it became known as the Black Metropolis. Um, and sort of following that into the 1930s and 1940s, there was the Chicago Black Renaissance. A lot of people don't know about it. I honestly had only heard of it in passing before doing research for this lecture. Um, but a lot of uh, black great art and culture came out of the Chicago Black Renaissance. Um, singers like Minnie Riperton and Sam Cooke, um, but also artists like Archibald John Motley Jr. and Elzir Kortor. Um, both of these works are on view right now in the Arts of the Americas galleries, so I highly recommend a visit. Um, this period, though, of prosperity didn't last. So we're, gonna, we're not talking about this time and place today, um, maybe another time, but for now we're going to keep moving, um, getting closer to the 2010s. So in, the, in 1934, the federal government created the Federal Housing Administration, or the FHA. The FHA insured private, mortgage, insured private mortgages, um, so they would ensure lower interest rates and smaller down payments. So it made it significantly easier to buy a home. Um, but they would only do this in what they called economically sound neighborhoods. Um, so they created maps and a rating system. They rated really nice white neighborhoods, A, and colored them green. We're looking at the south side, so you can see there's only one green neighborhood here. Um, and the rating scale goes all the way down to black and minority neighborhoods, which they rated D and colored in red, or outlined in red. So if you've ever heard the term redlining, that's where it's from. Um, that meant that it was significantly harder for people in these neighborhoods, like most of the South Side, if you look at this, um, could not have easy access to home ownership. So it's sort of another barrier that was built into this neighborhood. And it wasn't just the FHA, but other private real estate brokers, um, banks that would take on this practice as well. So it's hard to get loans, to buy other homes, to rent. Um, it just really made living on the South Side more difficult for people. And after World War II, uh, there was an increase in cars and roads. Um, so it became significantly easier to get out of the city into the suburbs um, because suburbs were previously inaccessible on public transit. But if you had a car and you could take the highway, you could get there really easily. So this led to a lot of white flight. White people left the south side and moved to the suburbs, and there was a housing explosion in the suburbs. This is um, Park Forest, Illinois, which is about 40 minutes by here, from here by car and good traffic. Um, this is an aerial view of it in 1952, a brand new housing development. You can see um, the advertisement on the right. Um, they started renting townhomes in 1949 um, and selling homes in 1951. So people began to leave the city. And this actually scared the city um, because there wasn't a tax base. It was hard to pay firefighters or police officers. There wasn't money to take care of things in the city. Um, so they started a period of urban renewal they identified 242,000 substandard housing units and a 23-square-mile zone of what they called blight on the south and west sides that they wanted to um, improve. Um, and they also invested money into um, some big institutions that built large campuses and complexes on the south side. So the Illinois Institute of Technology, the University of Chicago, and a few hospitals bought up land and did a bunch of construction sort of in the early... Um, the early part of the second half of the 20th century, so the 60s and the 70s. This here is a, a new dorm being constructed at the University of Chicago in 1957, and a couple of people observing. Um, this new construction displaced a lot of people. Um, it displaced about 50,000 families and 18,000 individuals. So the city had two problems. They had this blight, the substandard housing, as well as all of these newly displaced people. And to solve that, um, they built housing projects. The Chicago Housing Authority built a wide variety all over the city, but largely on the south side. There were 17 on the south side. 
Um, a more, we're looking at Stateway Gardens, which was in Bronzeville, but a more famous project that you may be familiar with is Cabrini Green, if you've ever seen one of the Candyman movies. Uh, <laughs> That, uh, that is what they're talking about, the projects that they're, they're visiting there. Um, by 1969, 99% of residents in family housing were black, and 99.5%, so virtually all, um, of units were in black or racially changing areas. And these were not nice places to live. They were poorly managed, poorly maintained. Um, when there became a crime problem, they became um, overly policed. Um, so th they were really not a solution. They added, they created more problems. Uh, and there weren't really other places to live, right? Because there were, you couldn't buy a house necessarily because you, it was too expensive or there were predatory lending practices or they just wouldn't give you the mortgage. Um, so there were limited options for people. At the same time, in the second half of the 20th century, all of the sites of industry that had employed people for so long began to close. So Union Stockyards, which was that absolutely massive meatpacking plant, closed. Um, and Wisconsin Steel also closed rather abruptly in 1980. What we're looking at this great photograph that I, I found in the Tribune um, is angry steel workers confronting the um, company officials and union officials about the abrupt closing. So jobs begin to leave the South Side. Now, there are only 50,000 jobs available within a 30-minute commute on public transit of the South Side. Within a 30-minute commute um, from, on public transit from the Loop or the North Side, there are 700,000 jobs. So there's a really stark difference in the opportunity available to people on the South Side. Unemployment is on the rise because there's all of these places that used to employ people have closed. There are no jobs to be found there. And if you can afford to leave the area and go to places with greater opportunity, you did. So people left, there's a lot of population loss. And as people left and more money left, businesses also began to leave because they had no customers to buy their goods or to use their services. And that meant that the people who were there then had fewer resources and fewer jobs because they couldn't work in those stores or for those companies. Um, and they couldn't buy things from those stores or use the services that were at those companies. So there is sort of a, a spiral. Um, things kind of got out of, out of hand. It's hard to stop. Um, and there's sort of a real lack of opportunity on the South Side. Um, that lack of opportunity leads to an increase in crime. I don't want to scare anyone. I, I'm not fear-mongering here, but there's just sort of a, it became a more dangerous area because if you can't do things legally, you might do them illegally because you have to feed yourself or your kids. Um, so that's why the South Side has the reputation that it does today. We're going to talk about one specific neighborhood because the artist that I want to talk about worked in one specific neighborhood, and that is Englewood. So it's here in the orange. Englewood is right in the south side. It's facing all the same problems that I just sort of outlined for you. Um, in 1960, it had a population of about 240,000. And by 2020, it has a population of, of 98,000. So again, a significant population loss. Um, in particular, there are a lot of foreclosures in Englewood following the Great Recession. Um, nearly 500 foreclosures a year. Um, we can look at a couple of a street in Englewood. We've got some home, some regular homes that people live in. You see house plants in the window right next to boarded up homes. Um, the city bought up a lot of those foreclosed homes, um, and they demolished a lot of them. For a while there, about a quarter of, of all demolitions in Chicago took place in Englewood. And the city didn't replace those homes with anything. So there are a lot of empty lots, which also sort of detracts from the neighborhood. The artist I want to talk about today, Amanda Williams, was inspired by these homes that were demolished, marked for demolition, and eventually demolished. That's Amanda Williams, born in 1974. She's from, born in Evanston, raised in Auburn Gresham, which is also on the south side, or perhaps you want to call it the southwest side, um, however specific you want to get. Um, she's a visual artist who is also trained as an architect, and her work sits at the intersection of color, race, and space. 
So she was inspired by these homes marked for demolition. She was also inspired by the same maps that I brought up earlier, the FHA maps, where good neighborhoods were rated A, marked green, and black or minority neighborhoods were rated D and marked red. So she was very interested in this color palette and the, the marking of the map. Let's hear from her a little bit. Red was the new black, and black neighborhoods were colored. The problem persists today, and we've seen it most recently in the foreclosure crisis. In Chicago, this is best symbolized by these X's that are emblazoned on the fronts of vacated houses on the south and west side. The reality is that someone else's color palettes were determining my physical and artistic existence. Ridiculous. I decided that I'd create my own color palette and speak to the people who live where I do and alter the way that color had been defined for us. It was a palette that I didn't have to search far for and look for in a treatise because I already knew it. What kind of painter emerges from this reality? What color is urban? What color is ghetto? What color is privilege? What color is gang-related? What color is gentrification? What color is Freddie Gray? What color is Mike Brown? Finally, I'd found a way to connect my racialized understanding of color with my theoretical understanding of color. And I gave birth to my third baby, Colored Theory. <laughs> Colored Theory was a two-year artistic project in which I applied my own color palette to my own neighborhoods in my own way. Now, if I walk down 79th Street right now and I ask 50 people for the, the name of a slightly greenish shade of cyan, they would look at me sideways. But if I say, what color is ultra sheen? <laughs> oh, a smile emerges. Stories about their grandmother's bathroom ensue. I mean, who needs turquoise when you have ultra sheen? Who needs teal when you have ultra sheen? Who needs ultramarine when you have ultra sheen? <laughs> This is exactly how I derive my palette. I would ask friends and family and people with backgrounds that were similar to mine for those stories and memories. The stories weren't always happy, but the colors always resonated more than the product itself. So to summarize, she identified colors that come from black culture or objects of black culture, and she literally monochromatically painted homes marked for demolition in Englewood. The whole house, as you can see, the sides, sometimes they painted the fences, the, the um, other little pieces around the yard um, for different houses. So just as Van Gogh and those other artists were painting the landscape, she is literally painting the landscape, making a physical intervention, visually marking these areas um, with her own color theory, her own color palette. Um, so I think that there's like a really cool comparison between um, these two very different approaches to observing a moment in time and marking that moment in time. She didn't change what was going to happen. So here we're looking at Harold's chicken shack, the red color, um, and we see it both pre- and post-demolition. So the work is, in a way, ephemeral. Although we have the photographs, one of these is in the Art Institute's collection, um, you can't go and see these houses anymore. That sort of physical intervention into the space no longer exists. Um, and it was something that was marked by the residents of Englewood, especially as they were painting the houses, people would come up to them with questions. Um, when she was painting the Crown Royal house, um, which is purple, a man came up to her and asked what it was for, and when she explained the project, he said, oh, I thought it was for Prince. 
so people were really in interacting and engaging, very curious about um, this sort of intervention into the space, which no longer exists. These homes are all demolished by now. This project was in 2015. So in ephemeral in a way, um, that perhaps paintings are not, right? Because we can go, we keep those, we carefully conserve them and put them on display forever and ever. But at the same time, both sets of artists, both Amanda Williams um, and the artist working in Paris, were recording a moment, observing a moment that is no longer there, a time and place that has long since passed. I do want to give a shout out to Englewood, um, which has changed much. It's been eight years since Amanda Williams made uh, Colored Theory. And so there are a lot of neighborhood groups, community groups that are working on the investment um, back into Englewood. We've got a, a gorgeous mural that's on the side of a Planned Parenthood in Englewood. There's a neighborhood association. Some of the empty lots that have been left from these demolished homes have been turned into community gardens. Um, so they're really trying to revitalize Englewood and bring it back. And the city is also trying to invest some money to bring businesses back um, and sort of, yeah, revitalize the area. But I want to return as a sort of final note to this quote um, from that clip from Amanda Williams. What kind of painter emerges from this reality? So again, the importance, the power of place, the title of this, of this lecture, um, how a time and place can inspire a certain artist um, and lead them to, or influence them to work in a certain way, to represent the world in a certain way. It makes me think about what we're looking forward to. How, for example, is the COVID-19 pandemic shaping the minds of young artists so that they make art in a specific way that we can't foresee right now? Or climate change. How did the orange haze in New York City last week impact young artists that we're going to see the results of in a decade or two decades or three decades? Um, what kind of art is being made in the world that we live in right now? That's the question that I want the answer to. I can't wait to find out. Thank you. We do have about 10 minutes for questions. Please raise your hand, and a staff member with a microphone will come to you. So any questions? Oh, there's one here. Go ahead. I'll ask one, um, and this is not the most sophisticated question, but I noticed in the exhibit that there were these pink frames, which clearly were not from the original frames from these artists. Was there a reason for that in the curating of that exhibit? Frames are chosen by, you know, a lot of those works come from private lenders or other museums, so often works come with the frames. I'm not sure which frames you are referring to offhand, but those probably came with the work. I can't imagine that Jacqueline and her team would have selected a pink frame <laughs> um, in particular, um, but works often come with their frames already and we display them the way they arrive to us, unless there's like conservation issues or things like that. Um, so it might just be a unique choice by a lender that when they display their favorite Van Gogh in their home, they wanted to have a pink frame. Um, hard to say for sure. That's an interesting question. I think frames are really cool. We sometimes give lectures just about frames. So <laughs> keep an eye out for some of those. So you mentioned um, the ephemeral nature of the work uh, from the South Side, right? The houses are no longer there. And yet we have these paintings from the Sen period from these artists. But the context itself was ephemeral, and those contexts no longer look the same. And I'm wondering what you think about then the production of new work by new artists and different artists from the same context, or not the same context, but the same physical place. Sure. That's a really cool question. Yeah, you're absolutely right that they are representing a moment that is gone. We can never sort of regain that. Um, there are artists who were, there are other artists that perhaps aren't as famous or just that we didn't want to feature in this exhibition who these artists were working with um, in Paris at the same time. Um, and in fact, some of the Impressionists were in Paris 
you know, just a decade or so earlier. And instead of painting in these suburbs, which were still changing, you know, in the 1850s and 1860s um, and 70s, but they decided not to paint those suburbs and instead to go by train out to further, further out areas. So it's sort of a personal choice, you know, like what about these suburbs attracted these specific people and um, led them to create art in a certain way. Um, it just wasn't as appealing, I suppose, to, some, to Monet um, or other artists like that. Um, it is curious to think about the other half of your question, which is when artists create the same art, even though they're coming from different times and places. I'm struggling to think of an example off the top of my head right now, um, but I'm sure there must be some where there's sort of a strange synchronicity across time and place that even though they're coming from different contexts, they're looking at the world the same way. That sounds like another lecture to me. Do you have any information on the current work with Amanda Williams and her um, redlining project uh, with the planting of tulips? Could you share a little bit about that if you're aware? I'm actually not familiar with that second one. Um, some of the most recent work that I've seen is that her, she has a series of paintings called What Black Is This You Say? that she's sort of working on in iterations starting in 2020 through to now. Um, and she's also doing, she does also, in addition to paintings and interventions like this, she does installations and thinks about race and space and color all together. I think she's a fascinating artist. Um, and I'm glad to know that you know a lot about her work and we're here today. Um, so yeah, I can't wait to dive more into what she continues to make in this sort of changing Chicago landscape. There's a hand here. Thank you. So I thought it was really interesting that you had this comparison between Paris and Chicago because Paris is also Chicago's sister city and the bridges um, in Paris with those artists, the bridges here, the railroads, Chicago. And just that you made this comparison of the timeline in Paris, which I think sometimes when you're looking at art, it can seem so far away, especially in a different time period or another country. But the way you juxtapose those with Chicago and the timeline and being a Chicagoan, you know, reliving that history, it was so similar. When you finished, it was so obvious to make the connection, but how were you inspired to bridge this Paris and those artists and then what was going on in Chicago at the same time? I wanted to tell a Chicago story. It's a great question. Um, I very much wanted to think about not necessarily these artists who are working, although the work is fantastic and it was very interesting to learn about these suburbs and to, to share it with you, it, I was very curious in how we could get to a contemporary moment and we could talk about something closer to home. Um, and so I took a look at, at various different Chicago artists and tried to think of who I wanted to talk about and make a connection. Um, and I thought it was so interesting that, of course, the techniques that they developed in the 1880s were all about color and new ways of working with color. Um, and Amanda Williams is also thinking about color in sort of a novel way. It's obviously very different from how they, those men were thinking about color, but still a, a novel approach um, in a certain moment. And I also thought it was very interesting to think about how the roots of following the history of the South Side, which the, be the first you know, 50 years of it, you know, from 1850 to 1900, the Parisian suburbs and Chicago were working on like similar tracks. They were influenced by, you know, the industrial revolution, um, industry was expanding. So the makeup and the way that those neighborhoods worked was very similar at that time. But we have a very different context because race is a huge issue. Not that race is not a huge issue in France because it is, they just don't talk about it. Um, <laughs> but race is much more prevalent and much more heavily discussed. And so the way that race, race, racial issues played out in Chicago forced the, these timelines, these two cities to kind of diverge from each other. Um, so I was very interested in how this like other factor created, made work that was very different and um, how Amanda Williams' perspective as a black artist growing up on the South Side really shaped her work on the South Side. I kind of deviated from the point, but I hope I answered your question. Cool. There was, a, yeah, up here. Uh, I had a comment and a question. The comment was that um, when you showed the picture of the University of Chicago and the dormitory, 
uh, speaking about the ephemeral nature and how those uh, south side houses are no longer there. That dorm also was my dorm and it's also no longer there. So, um, but my question is, uh, going back to the exhibition, is the fact that I noticed that three of the painters lived almost exactly the same lifespan, like 71, 72 years. And you hear a lot about Signac, you hear a lot about Bernard, but you, you hear almost nothing about Angron. And my question is, why, why is that? Was there nobody promoting him over the years? Um, that's sure. Yeah. It's like very interesting, like when I began to work on this exhibition, of course, we've got Van Gogh, this big name, and the, the exhibition's named after him. And then we have sort of these smaller artists who are huge pioneers. I mean, Seurat's a big deal as well. Um, but Signac, along with Seurat, like invented these techniques that we all talk about, but like I hadn't heard Signac's name as often. Bernard is also, the Cloisonne style is not seen as often. And then Angran, who I really never heard of. Like I had heard the name Signac, I'd heard of Bernard, um, but Angran was new to me. Um, these artists were all sort of not well received in their lifetime. Um, if you read the timeline in the exhibition, um, you'll learn that they tried to present at the big Paris salon that was like a big deal in Paris and that none of them could get their work shown there. Um, and so they had to start their own salon so that they could show their work um, because other people wouldn't show it for them. So Angron is kind of coming out of that, that people don't show his work, there's sort of a, a resistance to his style um, that lasted his whole lifetime. I'm actually not sure exactly, you know, sometimes artists just don't click with the environment that they're making work in or the, the time period that they're making work in. I actually should dig a little more into that. So you've asked a good question for me. Um, sort of see t through the end of his lifetime why he sort of remained in such obscurity. So sorry I don't have a better answer for you. We have time for one more question. Well, what you show in the, in, in the Van Gogh exhibit, of course, as you were saying, is a, a, a wonderful collection of artists who interacted with one another uh, and developed certain color palettes and styles. So what of Amanda Williams? You know, is there kind of an extension of her work? Did she spur other artists on the south side of Chicago or elsewhere to conceptualize a place in a similar way? That's a good question. I think that there's more a broad approach. There's not necessarily like one technique or one way that people are working um, in Chicago just now. So I'm sure she was influential and she has taught. So I think there's probably a lot of people who have been greatly impacted by her work who, are st who still haven't made it, um, who were her students um, when she taught at WashU or Cornell or wherever. Um, but she did make a big splash, I think, on the art scene in Chicago um, and sort of more broadly in the world. So I, I'm sure that work will continue to come out that it is influenced by her unique approach to color. Um, but I haven't seen it just yet. The other sort of big names, sort of especially like black Chicago artists that I can think of have very distinct styles to hers. Um, so I can't make any, can't draw any clear comparisons just yet. That was the last question. So I wanna thank you all for being so attentive, <laughs> sticking through it with me. I also want to thank our ASL interpreter, this is Alicia. And that's the end of the show, folks. Thank you so much for coming.